Hey guys, this is Sean Sewell with the Engagement.com podcast. want to give you a little intro into this discussion with Pat Flynn. Pat's a fantastic human being, very well-rounded. Not only is he a fitness professional, um, he covers theology, philosophy, uh, accomplished musician, and is a family man as well. In this discussion, we're going to go over how he structures his day, intermittent fasting, creating uh awesome songs from scratch. I'll have a little intro on the first two minutes. It comes in pretty hot, but uh, I'll have a link below where you listen to it in full, full quality on SoundCloud. And then also using your home for productivity, compartmentalizing and uh, tackling important projects over urgent product projects, as well as setting up quality time to turn off and be present with your family. It's a fantastic episode. You can learn more about Pat at chronicles of strength.com on his Instagram handle chronicles of strength. Uh, if you want to learn more about my businesses, that's Sean Sewell. I run Engearment.com, ColoradoPersonalFitness.com, and MountainFitnessSchool.com. Hope you enjoy the show as much as I enjoy talking with Pat. Let's get on with it. Sean Sewell with the Engearment.com podcast. Super stoked to have my good friend Pat Flynn, a.k.a. Chronicles of Strength, on for episode seven or eight, possibly. Wow. Most guest ever and uh, fun guy to talk with, as always. We're riffing before we push record, so... It is uh, January 13th, 2021. Uh, Pat, welcome back to the show. Happy New Year. It Happy is a pleasure year. to be here, as always, my friend. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure indeed. Well, Pat made my day this morning. He sent over a new track called Insert Coin. I'm going to give you guys a little jam on it real quick here. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Nice. Wow, super, <laughs> the bass is coming through like crazy on that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. I'll have a link to that below. Uh, so Pat is such a dynamic person. It's not just fitness, not just kettlebells, not just philosophy, not just uh, religion and theology, but an accomplished musician, as you can tell right there. P uh, Pat, how do you create these tracks? Um, yeah, uh, I wish I wish I had a more thought out um, creative process for for anything I do, but I really don't. I kind of sit down, um, never with never with a blank slate. So I always have like one or two kind of inspirations in mind of like um, I kind of want to and I always try to. So I guess maybe if I have any creative insight, it would be this. I always try to do um, something like this meets something like that, if that makes sense. So for this song, I had an idea where I was like, I'd like to do something like this ACDC song. And I was listening to a lot of um, Razor's Edge at the time, and there's just, just kind of a lot of cool riffing on that album. Meets something like this Black Label Society song. And uh, that's what you came up with. So whether anybody can pick out those influences, those are the two things I had in mind. So um, when I was talking to the guy who does the who does the drumming, um, so I do all the guitar work and I, I, I try and like compose the general structure of what I want the rest to sound like. I'm like, you got to have the kind of like just heavy – straight eighth note bass drum going through this that's that's the black label society influence and then the guitar riff is just me messing around um until i come up with something that i think sounds mildly interesting and i record it and then i try to make it sound mildly more interesting and then i re-record it and then i try to make it sound mildly more interesting and then and then i'm about done and then i'm like well that's good that's good enough um so it's really just um taking influences and playing around so I think I have something that is worth recording then uh, then maybe a little bit of refinement and then and then I'm done um so that one took about that was a quick that was a quick turnaround start to finish I probably had all, everything composed and recorded on that in about two days and then it was about a week uh once um my uh my drummer my drummer friend and all the drums and stuff that's all that's all just programmed there's no um actual drumming on that send it back to me so we're moving and shaking here mm -hmm. wow so i'm trying to wrap my head around this as a guitar player myself back in the day had a little Tascam four track recorder we'd record some guitar tracks and then play back and record another guitar track and maybe they lay down a bass line and i play the bass i don't play the bass but like so how do you so you record it do you like a wave file in the dropbox folder send it off to a drummer that's exactly right. So I do everything to a metronome. Um, so I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll figure out my tempo. I'll put the click track on. I'll record all the rhythm and then I'll do the lead. And for these past couple of tracks I've been doing, like the past four or five on my um, SoundCloud account, they're all just one, maybe two takes and just very, just all improvised, nice. uh, which is, which is fun because I like the creative challenge of that. 
Um, but I'll, I'll never, I'll never be able to play it again. Um, because I'm never going to take the time to go back and learn what I did. Right. You know what I mean? I just, it's just not worth it to me. So it's just like, it's a one, I'll never be able to repeat it because I won't want to, I won't want to put the effort into figuring out what I did. Um, so I, I like that. I like the kind of spontaneity, um, and the, uh, the challenge of that. And then, yeah. So then what I'll do is I'll, um, bounce the tracks out uh individually so like rhythm right rhythm left and lead and that's it it's usually just three tracks for me for the guitar um strip the metronome send it to the drummer send it to old drummer boy i don't even know his name he's just got some screen name um kind of give him tell him like what i'm looking for uh so i give him kind of some creativity in there but like you know like hey listen to this tune listen to that tune and maybe something in this style he sends it back. If I like it, I say, awesome, good. We're, we're good to go. And then uh, and then I'll send it to the guy who does the vocals, um, who I haven't been able to get a hold of recently. So I don't know what happened to him. So that's why they're just kind of instrumentals right now. Um, and then if and then same thing. And if he sends it back and we're good, then 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 that's it. That's the process. So it's just kind of like this online band of just freelancers that I that I work with. That's so cool. I'm so intrigued by this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like how you brought this up. I think on your podcast last week about the uh, one take for the solo. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And um, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Like back when I was a DJ, I record my sets and I use that as my demos for uh, a booking for a rave at a party or at a club. And a lot of my friends would um, perfect their demos. They would like take a lot of time and structure it. And my logic was I like the human element, the rawness. Yes. If you're going to play for a gig, this is going to, how it's going to sound. You can anticipate that. And that's what's exciting about it. As well, a that's a, that's ACDC for me. I mean, they. I, I don't know how much Angus actually works out his lead parts, but I mean, they record like live as a band, and it has a dynamic to it. I hate that that I think is irreducibly human and and exciting and raw and beautiful. And you just you just don't get that with the overly produced music these days. And same thing, I don't I don't loop any of my tracks. So like the first note you hear is different. It, it, there's that's the only time you'll hear that note specifically because I just play all the way through. I just repeat the rhythm because there's always subtle differences every time. I don't care how precise you are. There's always subtle differences, and I actually like that. And that's a kind of a very um, Van Halen inspiration. One of my favorite things to do was always just try and listen to the solo Van Halen isolated rhythm tracks, and they're so just raw and different and inconsistent, but in a really cool way, yeah. right? Um, and I've always loved that. And it's and it's sort of and then. Um, I also like the idea of a sort of man, this is going to sound weird, but a manufactured sloppiness. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is it's a, it's, it's, it's a sloppiness that is actually um, the result of a very high level of precision. And, and I first learned this when I was going to a, a guitar camp with uh, Joe Satriani. Awesome. And uh, kind of funny story. I went to this guitar camp. This was years ago with Satriani and like I knew he was going to be there. And I was walking around town the night before and actually just bumped into him on the street. And we had an incredible conversation. Super nice guy. Um, I was just walking to dinner and like he was on the sidewalk. I'm like, you're Joe Satriani. He's like, I am. <laughs> I'm like, sweet. <laughs> um, and anyway, the whole theme of his like people were kind of disappointed because they thought that he was going like, to get into all this like wanking and technical stuff. But he actually focused on this idea of not being super precise in your playing to be more to be more interesting and what he means by that is not being like lazy or sloppy because you have to learn to play really precise to be able to do this but learning to play slightly before but even more often slightly after the beat which is a really hard thing to do so it just but it creates this more kind of uh well more dynamism more more tension it's more interesting and i try to do that in the lead of the last song that, that i've showed you but also more in the rhythm of the song before where i'm just kind of flirting or dancing around the beat in the rhythm it's a little lazy it's a little lagging but i think it i don't know if people will even notice it and i don't even know if i did a, it accomplished it or not but it's something that i've i've tried to do that i think um to your point sean adds a, adds an element adds a dynamic that um that is human and makes music a lot more interesting that is just just that is, is again missed in so much of the overly produced stuff that's that's out there today I'm with you on that for sure. And I'm, and I'm glad that the way you explained it makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. And this goes for a lot of things too. And like one thing of our very first conversations is get it done, right? 
uh, don't worry about perfection. Perfection is not really attainable. Like, you can strive for it, but I think um, just energy and the humanism like you're putting out there really it feels better. And not only that, but if you're willing to do that, you'll you'll often end up with what I call um, happy mistakes. Yeah. And that's when like you'll make a mistake, but somehow it works and it sounds really cool. And then you just never tell somebody it was a mistake. <laughs> that's good. Oh, yeah. I totally meant to do that. That like awesome squeal or passage. Uh, yeah, that that. Yeah, that was on purpose. No, it wasn't. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. But but that's also or if it doesn't work out perfectly, there's like you sometimes there's a seed in that. That's cool that you can then develop. Um, so there's some, yeah, there's something about the idea of spontaneity and and not trying to be a perfectionist that I think can lend a lot to to creativity. I dig that, and, and again, that's good advice for for music or for writing, um, mm -hmm. for anything, any project. Just get going with it and come from the heart if you can. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Well, speaking of projects, what are you working on right now as far as uh, fitness projects? Ooh, well, we're doing um, – I'm about to uh, release a program called Kettlebell One, and uh, people are really excited about this more than I even thought because I've been playing around with this um, – I put up a post not too long ago where, where I said uh, the longer you're into kettlebells, the more it seems like – a 28 kilogram is probably all you need for, you know, for, for most men, the experienced male user, let's say for women, I'd say probably around like a, a 12 or 16, 16 kilograms seems about right. Um, and that seemed to, to resonate with a lot of people um, that this, this idea of a sort of a, of a sweet spot kettlebell. Uh, and as long as you're, you know, good enough and crafty enough with your programming, uh, 28 kilogram is, um, you know, it's heavy enough that it's going to provide a consistent challenge, again, for sort of like the average sized experienced um, practitioner uh, for the upper body grinds mm -hmm. um, and the lower body ballistics. You know, it's not going to be like super crazy challenging for goblet squats, but definitely like goblet squats feel really good yeah. with that type of weight. So the programming I've been doing and a lot of the workouts I've been doing and just having fun with is just we fix that variable. It's just it's just one kettlebell. And how can we promote as much general physical preparedness as possible uh, by just manipulating all the other variables, exercise selection, sets, reps, duration, frequency, uh, this and that. So that's the project. It's not done yet. Uh, it's almost done. Um, but I've been having a lot of fun with that. I mean, uh, today's routine was, was a really cool one um, where it was a kind of at the top of the minute routine. And um, you can uh, – let me know if I've, if I'm repeating myself, I feel like maybe I shared this last time, but it was, um, uh, so at the top of, at the top of minute one, you do 10 swings, just hard, crisp two hand swings at the top of minute two, you do another set of 10 swings, but then at the top of minute three, you do some upper body grinding exercise. So you could do maybe uh, two to five military presses, each arm, or, uh, if you have a, if, if you're into dips, you could do a set of dips. You could do push ups if you want to keep it really basic. Uh, you could even do chin ups or something like that. And then you repeat that sequence. So it's, it's sort of two minutes of swings, one minute of an upper body grind. And uh, you just go with that. Uh, you know, it could be 10 minutes, could be 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, probably anything longer than 30 minutes, you're going to be really sufficiently smoked. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what an awesome, um, I've been playing around with that a theme a lot. Um, and it just feels really good. Uh, you know, um, you get you get the you get the strength practice you get the swing practice you're you're huffing and puffing and feeling good and sweaty by the end so and you only need one kettlebell and 10 to 20 minutes and and you're good to go so yeah that's why i've been i've been that's that's what i've been doing that sounds great i, I get your emails and I, I love seeing your uh little teasers of workouts and my wife and i did one last monday morning so we just recently started um you know new year's everybody has resolutions so i don't <laughs> i just try to maintain but um so I made a, a pact with her that i would train with her every morning at 6 a.m and we the first one i did was one of yours and uh yeah it was the 10 swings and i think it was uh three presses and like three or five goblet squats Anyone oh yeah i think it, yeah was it the one where it was 15 swings five goblet squats three presses that's the one yep yeah it's a good sequence isn't it that was fantastic she loved it and um yeah, it's good. It's simple, right? We And she was using, uh, I think, a 14 kilogram, and I was using my the 28, which is that orange handle one right there. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Why is it that everyone, like, puts orange on the 28 kilogram? I don't know. I'm not kidding. Uh, at Dragon Gym, we had a, an orange piece of tape on the 28 kilogram, I, I think. 
at the gym I go to now, which is just a big box lifetime fitness, it's orange. And apparently you have orange. Well, on yeah. yours. I, everything I've seen from the traditional kettlebells, it is um, what? 16 and 18 are the yellows. Uh, 24 is green. 28 is orange. 32 is um, red. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, white. 44, the bulldog is, is uh, blue. And then the beast is black. Do you do it for just ease? Because we would do it for ease of group classes, right? Rather than like tell people to get like this, if they're new, just like go grab the yellow one or the white one, right? Oh, it's so funny. When I, I built a, a gym and size law firm, and so they wa- they wanted not to get the metal ones or the competition, they wanted like, the vinyl coated expensive ones, right? And so those colors don't correlate at all. So everybody's like, Sean, what kettlebells were we using? Was it yellow and green? I'm like, well, it's a different yellow. It's a different green than you're going to find from the link I send you. Uh, so yeah, I think across the board, like even in competition, they, they are similar, right? Is it, yeah, Well, so competition bells are interesting because they keep the same, um, um, the sort of the same, uh, what's, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for here? Um, like, like there, they're the same size, even though they're different weights. Same size, uh, different weights. Um, they're the same. Um, yeah. So, so like your tech, the idea is your technique shouldn't have to adjust at all because the, the handle is the same, the bell size is the same, et cetera. Right. So your technique should be consistent across the board. Um, even if the weight increases, which makes sense for a sport where that's going to depend a lot on just a specific fine tuning that you want consistency. Um, so that's why you wouldn't want like the bell size changing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a very good point. Like over here, my wife has a pink kettlebell and it is eight kilograms. Where is that guy? It's down there somewhere. Anyways, it's eight kilos and it's the same size as my 36 and my 20 and 22. Mm -hmm. So like, like Pat's saying, it helps with, um, consistency of form. And I did the IKFF one and two with uh, Ken Blackburn a few years ago and Mm -hmm. Yeah, you learn to, um, well, if, think about this. If you're a woman and you have like a, a 10 kilo kettlebell, it's going to have a lot more pressure right here, right? So it's nice if you had a competition belt to have dispersed pressure, you know, stuff like that. Right. So, right. And it's all, it's going to be pressure in the same place consistently. Mm-hmm. Right. So that way you get that nice kind of special kettlebell lump on your form that everybody <laughs> has, right? The kettlebell lump. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Is there, I don't know if there's a more technical name for that. Um, but you know that go, going back to that, I, I'm glad you guys did that sequence and you liked it. It's a really good one because you kind of get the like the quad um, uh, kind of pre fatigue with the swings. You get the anterior chain, you get the power, you get the conditioning, and then the goblet squat is kind of like a nice, I guess, finisher but also mobilizer for the lower body. It's five reps, so it's a good way to integrate the goblet squat there. And then, and then, yeah, you know, like three to five presses of the upper body grind, and you've got a pretty decent uh full body sequence there with just three exercises and one kettlebell so i love it and i like it's so simple on the minute you know basically um it, i want to give dan john credit here too because i've been using in my group classes his 30 on 30 off for the yeah. last seven months. it's super simple and a lot of it's just body weight based glute based core based and you're going to get a quality workout in all these people who overthink these workouts and they go through with calculators and plan things out I'm like that's for a very specific population. I think just getting some good high quality movement in is going to do really good for the GPP. Yeah, simpler is better for most people most of the time. If you're yeah, if you're if you're in the elite level, then a lot more fine tuning is is maybe maybe required. Uh, but for most people, stick to the basics. Pick you know stick to the to the big um, you know uh, multi joint compound exercises. Use progressive resistance. Use specialized variety. I've uh, been, been encouraging people. I've been going back to Pavel's great uh, Russian kettlebell challenge, the, his, the original book that I always tell people, get, get if you don't have that book by Pavel, got to get that one because it's great. And it's cool uh, to see like the evolution, but consistency within Pavel's thought, which is always um, which is always like a sign that we're working with a really good coach. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's what I mean by that, right, is – you know, for all of us, we're always trying to learn and grow. So we should always expect some type of evolution in our thoughts, right? If, if there's no evolution at all, that's a little suspicious, right? Like you just knew everything that there was to know right from the start. <laughs> I mean, maybe you did, like that's really impressive, but I've never really met anybody like that. Um, however, there's also the, the, the other thing that's suspicious is when one person says A one year and then they say something completely different, not A the next year. So there's no consistency. It's just 
one direction and then another direction. That's that's always suspicious. Uh, you know, and not to say that people can't be wrong and change direction, but if you're doing that all the time, it seems like you're probably just hopping around with fads and you're not really trying to really uh really master something right yeah. but with with somebody like pavel i think he kind of like this is this is one of the reasons i feel he's a great coach is you see this deeper understanding and um development of the principles that are always consistent in his work even if he has evolution and how he applies those principles so i'll give you an example right so he's um He's got these kind of like six or seven general training principles in the Russian kettlebell challenge book, uh, which are really good. I think that they all stand the test of time. Um, but his program minimum in that book was, if I remember right, and I should because I was just revisiting this, is, is actually swings and bent presses. That was his original yeah. program minimum. Um, that isn't the program minimum anymore, right? The, now it's it's swings and get up. So this is this is, and I think that's probably right because I think that there's it, that's probably a better specific application for most people. There's nothing wrong with the with the bent press or anything like that. But I think this is this is a clear example where Pavel is is definitely consistent with what he said before. Um, but you know, has has evolved in maybe a specific application of of um, in this in this case exercise selection. Yeah, Something it's like so that. true. Uh, there's a great post. I think it's on Strong First about going through Pavel's books, and it's almost always two lifts, right? Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, and um, the last one you mentioned, the swing and the get up with the simple and sinister, and then Quick and the Dead, which is that book right there. Um, it is the swinger snatch and the push up. So yeah, and then uh, like you mentioned the swing in the bent press so it's like basically an explosive and a grind although quick and the dead is explosive explosive but um yeah simple and, he, and i love that like you said pavel sticks to the fundamentals and it's been this way for 20 years plus you know mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I found your book the russian kettlebell challenge is only 2.99 for kindle right now is it back on sale again so that's that's funny because i i found that deal the other day and i'm like even if you already have it in paperback, you might as well spend a three bucks just to have it on Kindle and then you can like read it while you're waiting in line at the DMV or something, you know? Yeah. And I actually don't own, I have almost all of his work back to Naked Warrior, but um, I'm going to put the paperback in my cart right now. <laughs> Good man. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great, it's a really great book. Um, and it's always just, it's always just cool to see when you're, um, this is something I've always been fascinated in. Like anybody that I admire, a musician, a writer, a philosopher, a strength coach, I always like just going back through their sort of um, history of thought and just seeing how their thought has developed over time, how it's changed, how it's remained the same. Uh, if nothing else, that's just always interested me. I just always enjoy seeing that development. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. That speaks a lot to their integrity too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Not deviating a whole lot. And uh, speaking of integrity, I had to give Pavel a shout out because two years ago, he included me in that book on page 43. And um, our friend Matthew Flaherty, who you might know Matthew, um, he's on that same page, page 43. And um, most recently, I got to work with Pavel in November at our gym for the Strong Endurance. And he was the most respectful, kind person. And then just before Christmas, I got a, a card from him and his wife. That was super. I like that's on the refrigerator. That's my motivation, right there. He's a he's a man of his word. Very kind. Yeah, I haven't um I haven't had a lot of close um association with Pavel at all. But anything I've ever heard from people who have is just consistently how how good of a person he is. How how upstanding and and that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. The way he's conducted himself publicly over all these years, despite uh, you know, despite people not always um being exceedingly decorous towards him is of course something that, that I think speaks, speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on that. And yeah, he's always had integrity. Um, and there's no, there's another fun topic to talk about is these, I don't want to say cult, but like unique, um, bashing from different fitness groups, whether it's mace or kettlebell or other fitness dogmas, like why <laughs> I don't quite understand why anybody would want to devalue another person's point of view. So yeah, good. I don't get it. It's an interesting phenomena, isn't it? And I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it because I was, um, who was I? Was I talking with this with this to Dan John? No, I don't think it was Dan John. I I had a conversation about this with somebody recently, and um, I noted that I thought that that's toned down a little bit in recent years because there was definitely like a height of that sort of tribalistic fitness mindset, and it seemed to. Not to not to get into the bashing, but it seemed to kind of correspond with the rise of CrossFit yeah. in certain ways. 
Um, and there's certain many things I like about CrossFit. There's other certain criticisms I have about CrossFit. I think like with anything else, you got to just be willing to roll up your sleeves and try to really understand a position and say, yeah, that seems right. And maybe I wouldn't do things that way rather than just dismiss something sure. blanketly or out of hand. Um, but same, you saw it in the kettlebell world too, where there was just this very odd tribalistic commitment. And I think part of it um, speaks to maybe deeper issues of 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 what's going on in people's lives where they – they so over identify with something like my identity is a kettlebell user, right? And I will defend using kettlebells come high hell or high water against anything as the single best piece of equipment uh, of all time. Um, and, and then, yeah, you just get these really petty um, online uh, quarrels and, and, and quibbles and, and just nastiness rather than, you know, productive sharing of ideas and, and training strategies and, and stuff like this. But what I noted is it seems I was, who was I? I cannot remember who I was having this conversation with. It was like two days ago. K kids and sleep deprivation is what I'm going to blame that on. But I said that I felt like that this is toned down in when it comes to like fitness and, and training, but that it hasn't toned down when it comes to nutrition. That like you still get the kind of tribalistic wars. It seems to me very much in, in terms of like if you go out and you say something against keto or uh, vegetarianism or veganism, like you will you will stir the pot um, very quickly there. Um, but then I then I was thinking back more. Maybe that maybe that isn't the case. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I just spend less time in those circles that I just don't notice it as much. I'd actually be curious to hear your thoughts on it. You know that's a really good question. And I think um, we talked about this. I think in the last one about curating. Um, your information sources, right? So it sounds like you've done a really good job of, of curating and picking good people to be around and surround yourself with. Like on, on Facebook, I might see a post about a person saying, I'm getting off of Facebook, it's so toxic, and it's just fight book, and this and that. I'm like, I don't see that. Fight book. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's pretty catchy, fight book, all right. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, I don't see that. And I don't live under a rock, but I just, I don't like bad comments. I don't like people who just put out misinformation. I like family members and friends and great pictures of dogs and kids. And so my feed is pretty awesome. I, I, I turn on and I don't get sucked in for two hours. I get sucked in for 15 minutes and I catch up and yeah. make a little post and get the hell off of there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I think it's more of column A where it's uh, you've curated a nice environment for yourself. Not an echo chamber, just a nice healthy environment as opposed to um, – I was, I'll try and take in different podcasts to see what I have on the show. And, and I still see that going on. And I'm like, why are you hanging up on this pe people? Like, let it go. It's just a fitness tool, right? It's just a mace. It's been around for a long time before you were born, you know, or it's, a, I don't know. Everything has a place. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I think it's, I, th I think you are, you are right. I, I, uh, my guess is it probably hasn't gone away. I just don't see it as much for both. Yeah. That one is I, I kind of curate um, what I'm consuming and, and receiving intentionally again, not to do an echo chamber. Cause I, I surround myself with people with various um, views and positions on, on things, but only people with various and views and positions on things that are able to have a conversation about them in a, in a productive and civil way. Um, but also, um, kind of from my platform, I, I mean, I set, I said, I think I set the tone and the stage very early and very aggressively of saying, well, here's, here's what this conversation, uh, with me is going to, is going to be about. And, um, if that appeals to you, you know, welcome. Uh, but if you're gonna, if you're going to behave like a, a barbarian, then, um, then and we were talking about this before. Like I, I dropped the, hammer. I dropped the hammer pretty quick. Um, <laughs> there's not Pat Flynn is not a free speech absolutist when it comes to my community. It's like no, we stay on topic. Uh, it, it will always be respectful. Uh, it will always be, it will always be relevant. Um, so, so yeah. So there's that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can appreciate that. He's referring to one of our first conversations. I was asking for advice on how to help moderate a large Facebook group. Pat's got a great community, strong on. It's got great culture, great, great content, and um, well moderated. And uh, I was trying to use his knowledge for a group I help moderate or administer called the Colorado Backcountry Ski and Snowboard Group. And we're just shy of 11,000 people now. And it's super easy for a person to put one post on there and it just gets out of control. We have a. And a it tears the community apart. It does. Oh. 
So there's five of us total admins, four of us are very active, and we probably spend half an hour to two hours a day going through conversing. How do we want to interact? I'm like you, I'm like, just, just put the hammer down. I don't want to waste any more time on this. And, it, and for communities like that, it needs to be done. And I think we're, we've done a good job in Strong On because, you know, people like connect with me outside of Strong On and I, I can see like, okay, like person A and person B are like, worlds apart in terms of like their personal beliefs and commitments politically religiously like you see that outside of the group but once they're in the group they're getting along they're encouraging each other um and you just it, it, and that's and that's what i that's because that's that's what the group is for right it's like here's our common goal here's a commitment uh we're dedicated to the sort of principles of strong on of both mi minimalism and generalism we're coming around uh, this idea of of you know doing what we can to improve our our physical health and and fitness and this or that, um, and if you're not going to contribute to that conversation in, in a meaningful way, then you're just not going to be part of the conversation, and that's fine. That's fine. Um, but you can you're just that that'll be the end of it. You can just go you know carry on in some other group, uh, and and that would be my advice to anybody who wants to be uh some type of community leader or organizer you have to set expectations uh and the tone and the policy from the st from the start right it's not something you can try and push in after the fact it needs to be there from the very beginning mm -hmm. yeah no that's great advice um i, I pitched the idea to our our colleagues and like we need to have a fact page we need to have like expectations moving forward um because, yeah, you're right, because people will join not knowing expectations and feel entitled, and then you call them out on something they didn't know about. Um, yeah. Right, and yeah, and that's – because people you know, people also don't want to feel like they're being treated unfairly. So if you don't set the expectations from the start and, like, one person gets away with it, but then you crack the hammer on, you know, the next person, they're going to feel like, well, this is this is crap, right? Like, And so you don't want that either. So you have to do it from the very beginning and say, this is what our community is about. These are the expectations. These are the guidelines, uh, and here's what the 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 you know the punishment will be if if you violate it. Um, and then if somebody does cross the line, well, you were warned. Yeah, you you didn't hit criteria one, two, three, or four, or you you know went against them. You're out. Right. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, so the situations we're encountering in that group is not fitness based or religious or any political. It's it's really kind of unique it's avalanches and terrain choices in the mountains right so we we do our best to bring in accurate information from colorado avalanche information center american avalanche institute institution like anybody we can and they actually will post and say hey look at this person was caught in a slide they live thank goodness but what can we learn from this and then it gets heated on what is your risk tolerance? Like my risk tolerance is really, really low, <laughs> like low lying fruit. I want to see my wife again at the end of the day and walk my dogs and see my friends and family. Mm -hmm. I don't need to impress anybody. I'm not doing anything crazy dangerous, but in the back country, there is no uh, mitigation. There's no ski patrol. There's nobody going to save your ass. It's, it's all on you. Self-reliance mm -hmm. and, and your team, if you have a team with you. So yeah, it's a very unique situation. And we try and approach it delicately. A lot of people, you know, they associate their identity with this backcountry skiing and snowboarding. And that's for a lot of them, that's what they have. A lot of them are dealing with major stuff that Pat and I talk about anxiety, depression, grief, loss. And they identify with these, I don't want to say extreme, but pretty extreme sports as a way to work through that pain. So I don't want to take that away from them. <laughs> I want to enable them and help them. But if you're going to be a dick, you're out of here. Right. That's it. That's it. And like, you know, there's, there's opportunity there for some like soul searching, like, okay, why, why are you so emotionally committed to this relatively obscure thing? Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know. I don't, because I don't know where you're coming from, but that's at least worth thinking about, right. That you're, that you would get so agitated and so upset about um, the fact that somebody prefers using barbells to kettlebells for overhead press. Like why, why does that agitate you? So <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, I really don't, but it's worth thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, a great way to bring it back around. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't take yourself too seriously, people. Yeah, at least not on things like 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 that. I mean, obviously, there's there's issues and topics that are very important and very relevant. But it's ama But the, I think the point we're trying to make is it's amazing how people can inflate the importance or significance of things that really aren't very important or very significant. Absolutely. Right. No, mm -hmm. I, I see in things as finicky as the zipper on a jack is what obviously in gearman. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Freaking zipper. It goes up and down, closes your jacket for you. 
people people get caught up on the little details, little minutia, and um, mm-hmm. I don't know why they do it. Very- you know, and I, I wonder if you know, for some people, I don't want to like you know, I try not to pretend to be a psychologist, even on a podcast, but a little armchair psychoanalysis here and there can be fun. You know, like you kind of, you kind of see it in like relationships. Sometimes it's like when like you and your wife, like fight over the toaster or something. Yeah. It wasn't really the toaster. It was like all this other stress that's been building up for months and months or whatever, that it was just like the poor toaster was the thing that brought it all out. You know what I mean? Maybe it's something like that. Mm-hmm. It's a pair of shoes by a door or the trash or, <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's true. Especially last year, spend a little more time at home. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's there's always something deeper behind it. And I and I'm really curious because I do get to work with a lot of really high level athletes that do crazy, in my opinion, crazy stuff. And I'm like, the first question I want to say is like, what are you running from, honestly? Like, and I I know because I've been through a lot of pain too, and I associate those activities with a nice positive release. But by and large, most extreme athletes I meet are running from something. There's some escapism going on there. For sure. Yeah. I'm right. Judge. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth thinking about. It's worth considering. And I think we can all, you know, I think you see that in society in so many different, in so many different ways, right? You know, maybe it's not the extreme sports. Maybe it's just video games. Maybe it's mm-hmm. Netflix. I think just the whole idea of escapism is something that um, I think we all are susceptible to it and fall into it from time to time. We're kind of, you know, running away from our demons, so to speak. It just might be more obvious in some people than others. Mm -hmm. And I'll be a first admit, I'm guilty of it too. I mean, I go to the mountains. Well, I haven't been going to the mountains as often as I'd like. (laughs) I'm going today though. Um, But yeah, I go up there and I just, I just stare. I'm at peace. And you know, that could be labeled as as escapism. And I kind of did. I escaped the city. I went to the mountains, watched my dogs play. Um, but yeah, I think we all have a little bit of that. Well, well, I think certainly like just getting away and resting a while is like necessary too. So I think there is a, a balance to be appreciated, but I mean, to just tie it back into fitness and, um, and nutrition, you definitely see this, right. And I think it becomes very obvious with like the phenomena of eating disorders. Um, it's a very curious thing. Um, because you, you often hear, you know, some of the research on this is very interesting because you kind of have a, a sort of chicken in the egg situation where it's like, you know, one shouldn't promote certain dieting or extreme dieting because it will uh, promote eating disorders. But it also sort of works the other way around. People who already have certain psychological disorders are attracted to that stuff, right? It's a way for them to feel like they're going to have some greater sense of control uh, in life in general where maybe they're suffering from some some past issues where that uh, – there was a traumatic event where, where that has led them to feel like they need to have control in, in something, right? However, there's also other research that shows that, yeah, like extreme periods of dieting and, and training in and of itself can actually traumatize a person uh, physiologically and psychologically that it could manifest into certain disordered attachments as well. So there's like – it's a little column A, a little column B. Um, but I would say in, in my experience – Usually when it comes to the escapism of all my many years of coaching, it's usually people who are bringing in something deeper that hasn't been dealt with, and then it's sort of manifesting itself in this sort of arena of fitness and obsessive compulsive dieting and exercise, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Oh, it totally does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I see that too to a smaller extent uh, with people I work with. They'll come in and – Here's a unique thing. Uh, not that I'm a psychologist either, but like the why. There's like the five whys, and then there's like the seven whys. You're like, why do you want to do this? Why? And then you keep getting down. And if you get to number six and seven, you're, I mentioned this on the last podcast, you're probably going to be crying because it's like really heavy stuff, you know, because, you know, why do you want to lose the 10 pounds or why this? And then you get down deeper and deeper. And it's because my dad was an abusive alcoholic. And right. you know, right? yeah. Level four. He got three more levels. Four. <laughs> Because of daddy's angry juice, right? I like angry juice, though. But uh, <laughs> not to to downplay any of the seriousness in there. And as we've Sean and I have talked about before, we've we both have our our baggage and difficulties as well. So, right, yeah, it is a constant work in progress. Right. Yeah. We, everybody's got something. Right. That's the one thing that. Um, you know, appearances are always far from. Uh, at, you know, and that's that that itself is something I've really come to appreciate of just working with so many people of so many different backgrounds is online, offline, is that you don't know the full story until you know the full story. Right. And you rarely know the full story. Um, 
and I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. And, um, I think we talked about this before about, it's very easy to manufacture a superstardom, manufacture a perfect profile. And, um, Pat's been very open about this and I try and be as open as possible about talking with anybody about grief and depression and anxiety and insomnia and all the things that I personally can speak about, honestly. And I would hope that people would, you know, either take into account that it's also the other side of the coin. It's not just cool mountains and dogs and kettlebells and Pavel and this and that. There's a plenty of other things, <laughs> you know, we all have our own battles and I'd be, I'm happy to be open about it because I want other people to be more open about it and work on it and seek help. Right. Come on, you can get better. There are people want to help you. I want to help you. Right. You know, and it is interesting. I think it's actually getting better, right? Because you have a lot more people who are, um, who are now willing to recognize the importance of mental health. Like we've had physical health for so long, like that has been, been recognized, but there's also mental health or spiritual health. Right. So uh, for me, it's, it's gotta be a complete package. We need to, we need to treat the human person as a human person holistically and uh, health and harms can come in many different, many different ways. And if you're dealing with something that is a mental health problem and you're only trying to give it a sort of physical solution, you, you might just end up not only just chasing your tail for a while, but you might actually be making it worse in some respects. So, which also means you need different tools and different experts. You know, you can't expect the personal trainer to, to be the, to, to, as they often turn into this, a pseudo psychologist, social worker, right? As any personal trainer who's been in the game long enough knows your clients quickly, quickly want to turn you into their, their therapist. Um, and like, but, but that, that just speaks to exactly what we're saying. Like, okay, maybe this isn't just a physical issue and it rarely ever is right. Because the human, like everything is connected, everything matters. So something that is, you know, seems to be obviously a physical problem on the surface probably isn't just that once you really start probing deeper. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. You'll find out the why. Oh, this is really, this is great. I love our conversations. They cover a lot of territory. Yeah, we're rocking and rocking and rolling. Uh, no, it's always it's always a joy. It's always important, and I hope um, I hope we give something both practical and tangible, like the like the workouts. Always good to have some workouts. But then uh, I I enjoy you know trying to explore some of the, especially the behind the scenes stuff that uh, you know is um, that you experience is you know through a, a career of being a of being a, a coach of, of various sorts. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you on that. It's uh, fitness is important. Workouts are important. Um, the connection is super important. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about this. Any advice for people out there for like creating new habits, especially during, I know that you work from home and you're already established in this routine. A lot of people aren't, although they are now, it's been almost a year. Mm -hmm. Any advice for creating home habits for, for sanity? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good, uh, good question. Um, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll reiterate. I'll start by be by reiterating your your first um, uh, remarks that that you made is 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 about the why. Like, um, it's it's hard to build a habit around something that you don't see um, any like significant importance to, and I mean significant importance. Like, it really has to matter to you um, because if it just matters a little bit then after two weeks, you're probably not going to keep going. It has to matter enough. It has to be significantly important. So I know you didn't, you said you didn't set any New Year's resolutions, but I'd be curious to hear your goals um, if you have any this year. But for me, you know, I had uh, different different goals. Um, and then I'll, I'll tie this into the, into the habit thing. Um, I wanted to get at least six, you know, new guitar tracks out. We, we already got two, so we're, we're doing all right with that. Um, we're ahead of schedule. I wanted to get at, at least one, but maybe two, um, new, um, academic articles published. I have one written, uh, and it's under review by a, a couple of peers right now. And then I'll hope to submit that soon. So we're ahead of schedule on that. Um, I wasn't going to have a new book goal, but I have a pitch out for a book right now. So if that, if that gets picked up, then I will, I'll, I'll put that in the list, but I'm kind of leaving that up to, uh, to Providence at this point. Um, and then fitness goals, you said maintenance. Yeah. I mostly maintenance on fitness goals. I want to improve my handstands, kind of refine some stuff I'm doing there. I want to get my general swing volume up and uh, participate in some of the more challenges I'm doing with, uh, kind of my, my strong on crew right now. Um, 
And then, of course, I have my um, just kind of personal relationship and, and family goals, too. Uh, but the, the point being is that every goal that I've set has uh, significant importance to me yeah. in, in some way. Um, I, I, I don't and don't think I can set goals that aren't significantly important to me because I know that I will not have the impetus to do it. Um, I won't do. It. I mean, this is this is why. Um, this is why I'm I'm sitting in a pigsty of a basement right now. Um, I'm pretty ruthless in the pursuit of the things that are important to me, and I'm no. And this is probably a, a vice of mine. I'm pretty notorious in neglecting things that aren't <laughs> right. Um, so if you looked around my basement right now, it looks like a pigsty uh, because cleaning it up isn't that important to me right? it, it takes away from the time of the stuff that is really important to me so i am i am definitely somebody who lives on the extremes and um but i also think that i get a lot of stuff done so i'm not willing to say that i'm not willing to say it's complete it's definitely vicious in some aspects because there's there's certain areas of my life where i need to i need to i, I should clean i should clean up just looking like i should really clean this up because it does give me headaches um, in other areas. Um, but for me, setting goals that are so important allows me to be so excited that I can just be very single-minded about them. Yeah. And then when it comes to practical implementation, you for, for me, it's about blocking and compartmentalization. So the first part of my day, um, you know, I wake up um, uh, and uh, you know, you get the coffee going, do some reading. Uh, have some quiet time, do some prayers. But then the first like really towards uh, the productive part of my day is always is always writing. And I just have a big block of time. Um, and the reason I do writing early and first is because for me that that takes the most uh, creative mental energy and I feel best at that in the mornings. So I prioritize that. Um, then when that's done, um, I will go to the gym and I'll work out because I'm still, I have my best energy sort of before, before noon, so to speak. Uh, so there's another one of my kind of priorities is of working out, but I, I put the mental juice into writing first. Then I work out, give the brain a little time to recover. And I just did that before our, our podcast. So I'm an early riser. I'm up pretty early. I get usually before six o'clock, usually I'm getting at it between five and five thirty. Um, then, uh, you know, after lunch, that's when I'll do my music stuff. Um, you know, so I'll dedicate one to two hours practicing, playing, recording guitar, this or that. Um, then come like two or three o'clock, I'm about as worthless as it gets as a human being. So that's when I'll do like ancillary business activities, like like monkey work, right? Stuff that needs to get done, but I'm not very excited about. Then, uh, you know, always... Generally, about an hour before dinner, I, I like to unplug because then it's then it's got to focus on family time, right? And I really don't like and I'm not good at going like right from working to dinner. So I need that space to like disconnect my mind from my other creative projects. So that way I can actually be, be present uh, and attentive to my family. Because even though I work from home, I totally com compartmentalize like there's just um, and I think that's important. I think it's here's another thing with habits is this idea of like having sacred spaces. So the idea of that is like you have dedicated spaces in your house or if or wherever you go where when you're in that space, you do that thing. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in this part of the basement, I do podcasts. When I'm in that part of the basement, I do music and they don't mix. When I'm in my office, I do my writing and that's all I do when I'm in sort of my my layer or whatever I call it, that's where I do my reading and my research and my studying. Um, when I'm in my bedroom, we do the two special bedroom activities, right? That's it. There's no like TV or anything else. You know, we don't have a TV in it for that exact reason. Right. So I'm I'm really big because you know it sets up these sort of automatic triggers that when you just enter a space, uh, that's what you do. Um, so I'm really big in compartmentalizing have, uh, and blocking and having sacred spaces in terms of here's what I'm going to do during these times of the day. Here's where I'm going to do them. They're all really important to me, and I'm going to be ruthless, ruthless about getting it done, ruthless about eliminating distractions, and also doing what is important before doing what's urgent. Uh, so in a sense, it's you know it's urgent to answer some emails. But it's not that important in the long run. What's important is I do my writing projects. 
So I can do the urgent stuff in the monkey work business. So I think that's a trap that people fall in with habits and productivity. They keep doing what's urgent or what's immediate or what just came up in the last five minutes mm -hmm. that they never focus on what's important and what's deeply meaningful. Uh, so make sure you focus on the importance before the urgence, compartmentalize, block your time, have sacred spaces, and pursue the stuff that's most meaningful to you. I don't know if I have anything else more than that, honestly. This is great. This is like a guideline. <laughs> to answer the question in such good detail. This actionable makes complete sense. I love it. Yeah, it's a great schedule you have. And I love that you do the important thing before the urgent. I'm guilty oftentimes of urgent, like reactive kind of stuff. And then uh, you lose track of the important super easily. Um, and then having specific areas for specific activities. I really ad admire and appreciate that. Like you, no TV in the bedroom for those reasons. And um, yeah, like there's th this room is compartmentalized. You know, there, like you said, music over there, podcasts over here, virtual training over there. Like that's, those are the zones. That's, we don't have a big house or big home. It's a great home, but it's not, I don't need a lot of area. Just having those areas that are great. specific to those things. Yeah, you don't need a mansion to do it. Like in this basement I told you about, it's like, I don't know, what is that, 12, 12 feet? But this these six feet is for podcasting. Yeah. Those six feet is for music, and they don't mix, right? They're, they're different. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is super helpful. Yeah, and you're an early riser too. This is, this is kind of funny. I got up at 4, 4.30 every day for 20 years up until March, middle of March. And I found myself like sleeping in to like 5.30 or 6. And so I had to really work hard to sleep in. My wife gets up a little bit later. Okay. And um, yeah, I'm going back to getting up earlier. I, I like to get things done, like you said. And question for you, do you feel like you're more cognitively enabled because you're fasted? Yeah, generally, yes. Um, so if I have any food in the morning, usually it's just a protein shake. Cool. And does a protein shake affect, do you think, in any kind of way the fast? Uh, well, certainly you're not, but you're not, you're just technically not fasted if you have a protein shake. Um, you know, we might say it's a controlled fast, but that's just using some very loose talk. But uh, for me, generally, in terms of productivity, I feel like, yeah, I can, I can entertain uh, a protein shake and still feel pretty productive and energized. But if I have a, a you know, like a, a meal of some eggs and potatoes or something like that, I, it almost always slows me down. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing that. Me too. Like I've literally, I have to, to force myself to eat a late lunch because I will go fasted and not because I'm thinking about it. I'll have coffee. I'll put like two scoops of collagen in there, some MCT oil, and that's it. Yep. And then water until, two or three sometimes. And I'm like, I should really get some calories in. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got to remember to eat. Yeah. So I have, uh, I'm pretty like, um, I said this on my wife's podcast and she wanted to like throttle my neck because, um, because I say like, I'm notorious for under eating, which of course is like most the opposite of most people's problem. Right. But that's, 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 that's my problem. It's very easy for me to under eat. It's very easy for me to, to stay lean. That's just sort of the habit and the disposition that I'm in. I am a quote unquote dispositional skinny bastard um, <laughs> who used to be a chubby fat boy. So it's an interesting thing. Um, but no. So what I'll do is if, um, if I have like a heavier, harder training session, I'll usually have the protein shake. Um, but if not, then I'll usually just have my coffee and tea. Perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and like you, I thank you for uh, saying that I feel kind of bad. Cause I'm like, I really need to eat more calories. I'm burning like on paper, 3000, 4000 calories, especially if I go climb a mountain. Right. And mm -hmm. so I have to really force myself to eat. And it's not until evening that I'm actually honestly relaxed, but maybe relaxed enough to be hungry. And then my wife's like, stop eating at six or 7 PM. And I'm like, no, I'm actually have my appetite now gonna have some raw fish yeah i am a nocturnal um eater for sure so my uh, my my eating has been largely the same pretty much since college where i'll either fast or have a shake in the morning generally a light lunch occasionally occasionally i'll have a more substantial lunch so it could sometimes just be another shake or it might be a salad or some some soup or chili or something like that um but it's it's rarely a substantial meal just because I don't and can't cook. <laughs> so, so there's kind of like a, an artificial constraint there or an involved, we may have involuntary constraint, I should say. So unless I can like, you know, bug my wife to, to make me something, it's just, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, and then family dinner um, in the evening. So, 
one to two small meals and then a more substantial meal at night is is how I've been eating fairly consistently uh, since college. Now I've I've altered that and changed that you know accordingly to various like training phases because sometimes like I just like you like if there's if there's harder training or there's there's a specific strength uh, goal I just I need to get more calories in. But oftentimes you know I'll just get the more calories in by just having more substantial shakes. Right, I'll just increase the protein. I'll start dumping some carbohydrate sources into it. Uh, so it might not even change the structure of my eating too much. Just the specifics of what I'm eating. That makes sense. And for for reference, you know, a, a good workout, like he mentioned, the, the 20, 30 minutes, you'll you will have a need for some calories. And when I go climb a mountain, people don't understand. Actually, a long time ago, you you mentioned who wants to ski uphill, and I was like. I like skiing uphill. <laughs> and then uh, Pavel's like, the best thing you could do is lunge uphill with weight on your back. I'm like, well, that's what I do. Like every time I go in the mountains, I lunge up a mountain and then I snowboard down to the truck. And then just for heck of it, I turned on my, my Apple watch just to get like an idea. And in like maybe 45 minutes, it was like 600 calories or 700 calories. And that wasn't even the hard part yet. So I turned it off because I don't want to freak myself out and think I have to go eat a whole pizza or something to recover. But it's it burns a lot of calories. You know, it's it's funny because um, I I think I made that comment because I think I think Ace put out some uh, a paper on some research they did on on the calorie burn of swings or something like that, and they said it's about the equivalent of uphill cross country skiing. So I'm like, well, the best thing about kettlebell swings then is that it's not uphill cross country skiing because who on earth <laughs> would ever want to do? It? But then I found the one person who actually enjoys doing that. So I, to to every rule, there's at least one exception, right? Mm -hmm. I like to be the weirdo for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's super helpful. And I love how you compartmentalize. I can be better about this. I'm very notorious for um, reacting to what I think is urgent in the late afternoon to evening, restructuring for the next day, training or, or sessions or whatever online content. So uh, I should be better about blocking out time for my family as well. So I'll take a page out of your book for that this year. Well, well to be fair, some some urgent things do conflict with the important things. So, you know, we just launched a new, uh, well, it was the pre-order for the Kettlebell One. And I was, it was kind of in the afternoon and um, I was just doing some, some reading and, um, which is important to me. Like the reading and research part of my life is very important because it always ties into my writing in, in some aspect. And, you know, there is a number of people who are just having some technical issues with um, with the sales ordering page and stuff like that. So that was an urgent thing that I was like, all right, I actually have to attend to this now. So there are there are, of course, again, every rule has its exceptions. But generally, I would say um, keep your focus on what's important, not necessarily what's urgent. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. Um, and back to your question about. What are my goals this year? I'm, I'm not good at resolutions because I just like to think it should be something that's sustainable and not just like January only, which is very common in our industry. Um, so my goals this year are to make a few online courses, one for professionals, uh, because I, I, we, before we push record, I've been working with a lot of professionals, not just in the fitness industry, but um, financial planners and uh, attorneys and people who, who present online content and engage customer facing, but not in-person customer facing currently to create uh, best audio video practices for Zoom and other places. So I'm gonna create a course for that and have like a list of like, um, and Pat gave me the idea actually, to do like entry level, middle of road, high end, super high end, and what those look like and how much those cost and how to set them up. Um, so I'll put that up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna film it this afternoon. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. I'll put that together. And then uh, for people at home, you know, home fitness. I love doing the zoom classes and stuff. I love it, but not everybody can attend at that time. And so I'm just going to create like a $200 shopping list of what's in stock, you know, suspension trainer, kettlebells if they're in stock. And then here's a progression for you and the family, you know, and then yeah. they can download it and go about it on their own time and share it with friends. I'll, of course I'll watermark it. So if they do share it, it'll share the, the business logo right there. But mm -hmm. yeah, so those are my, um, my goals, my personal goal is to get in the mountains again. I used to be up there two or three days a week. Literally, it's been twice in like eight months. So I really need to get back to what's important to me, which is spending time in the mountains and being creative and enjoying the company of my friends up there. So those yeah. are my Yeah, that's cool. I like those. Those are very good. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm not a big uh, resolutions guy. I, I'm not like ardently against them either. I mean, I've seen people um, 
radically change their life after setting resolutions. So I'm, I'll meet I'll meet people wherever they're at. But just for me personally, I do like to um, have certain things that yeah, if I could do that or this um, this year, um, cool. But they're never like um, or they haven't been major like life overhauls for the most part. Um, just things I want to get done. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. Well, this is great. I've got a great checklist of uh, very actionable, which is the key, <laughs> actionable things from Pat that you guys can implement. Workout wise, uh, learning more about uh, Kettlebell One um, program. And how much does it cost to get signed up for that? Yeah, so the pre-order is just 20 bucks. So I think it's a pretty sweet deal right now. Uh, we'll be running the pre-order sale all this week. Uh, best place to take advantage of that if you're interested is on my email list, which you can join at... 101 kettlebellworkouts.com and that will they'll give you a free pdf of just 101 different kettlebell workouts you can you know kind of serve yourself buffet style and then uh and then yeah and then kettlebell one will be it'll be launching later this weekend but it's on uh i always do like a little pre-order thing for subscribers and give some bonuses and discounts for people who who for their for the early action takers if you will mm -hmm. that's awesome that's awesome and uh, I wanted to give you some credit to our friend, Justin Raywa. He's a, a kettlebell instructor through Strong First here in Denver, moved to Michigan. And I think today he tagged you in a workout that you put together. All uh, right. Yeah. I'll link to it. You can get a fantastic form too. A fantastic form. Is that on uh, on the old Instagram or Facebook? Yeah. Or is it on Fightbook? It's on the Fightbooks. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be sure to go make some rude remarks then. Oh, he'll love that. Yeah. He tagged you on uh, Instagram. Chronicles of Strength is Pat's handle on Instagram. And I'll have a link to the 101 kettlebell workouts.com as well. And then I'm going to have an outline of, of uh, the advice that Pat gave about compartmentalizing um, important over urgent uh, an hour before dinner, unplugging to unwind and be present for the family. Uh, very much respect that. No, this is great. I, yeah, I, this is always a blast. Thank you, Sean. My pleasure. Thanks for giving me over an hour of your time again. <laughs> it's always very, very helpful and very insightful. And I learn a lot from these conversations too. And I have a lot of my homework to do from you. So I appreciate that. Anytime. You know, I always, I always enjoy it. Wonderful. All right. Engagement.com podcast viewers, listeners, readers, subscribers, all the good things. We'll have all the links to get in touch with Pat, his awesome programming, his awesome Instagram handle and other podcasts from previous conversations with Pat for your listening and viewing pleasure. Until next time, take care.